Welcome to Sprinkle with Hope podcast and your host, Shane. I am super excited for our guest today. Ashley Rhodes Quarter is joining us. Uh, I heard about her a few months ago and we've been working to get her on. We're so excited that she's joining us. Ashley, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm thrilled. So to give you a little background about Ashley, what I know, so I'm going to read this off her, her bio on her website. Uh, really growing up, she went through a lot of tough things. She was born to a single teen mother and went through a lot of um, foster homes and those type of things. And I love this quote that she says, my education was the one thing that nobody could take from me. I just love that because that's true. I, I believe it. I think growing up, that's one thing that nobody can take from you. So that's a little snippet about Ashley. Ashley, why don't you fill us in, you know, some things that you've gone through and things that we can learn. Absolutely. Well, as you just mentioned, I grew up in foster care. So that's kind of where my story began was, um, as everyone, you know, you're born, but um, I was born to a single teen mom who was actually living in foster care in a group home herself when she got pregnant with me. So in a lot of fields, they talk about that cycle of abuse. So you have cycles of abuse and poverty and neglect and my circumstances were just one that illustrate what that looks like, multi-generational. Um, my biological grandfather had a seventh grade education. My mother and her four siblings had all been removed from um, our birth family or her birth parents. My biological grandmother had five children before her early twenties. So, you know, this was just this, this total, uh, the, the cycle, that's, that's what it is. It's the yeah. cycle of abuse. So as statistics state um, or predict, my brother and I ended up in the foster care system and I spent almost 10 years in foster care. And during that time, I had 14 different placements and there, there are plenty of my foster brothers and sisters who have 20, 30 placements. So wow. all of our stories sometimes have these common threads, but sadly, my story is not unique. It's definitely definitely not the only one. And I was just bounced home to home. Sometimes I was with my brother, sometimes I wasn't. And I later learned that more than 25% of my caregivers were or became convicted felons. Wow. So I was, I was placed in homes with people who had problems with drugs, alcohol, violence, pedophilia. You know, these were circumstances where things are falling through the cracks and people who had no business caring for children were, you know, front and center taking kids. Meanwhile, kids like me who complained about our circumstances, we were just thrown out like trash right. and everyone right. called us liars and troublemakers. Mm -hmm. And especially for foster kids, there are so many preconceived notions about why kids end up in foster care in the first place. People think it's because we're juvenile offenders or there's something wrong with us, but the reality is no child enters the foster care system because of something that they've done. It's mm -hmm. because they have been victims of abuse or neglect or circumstances well beyond their control. Right. And there are kids who linger in the system for years and years and years, even though there are laws that are supposed to combat that. And statistically, across the country, there are upwards of 500,000 kids in foster care at any given time. And 50% or less of those kiddos will even graduate high school. 3% or less go on to higher education. So just to give your audience a little bit of an idea of how vulnerable this population is, it's absolutely, it's heartbreaking what happens yeah. systemically. But I hope that my story ultimately <laughs> inspires people to step up to the plate, be a part of a community initiative that is meaningful to them um, and create that full circle journey for a chance to have a child who can survive their circumstances. And it was my adverse childhood experiences that ultimately inspired me to become a social worker and an advocate and really laid the foundation for everything that I'm doing today. That's awesome. That I was going to ask, you know, I, we love talking to people who have gone through tough things, not that the hard thing is the thing that defines them, but the things after those hard things are the things that we like to focus on the positive things. Um, you've written several books. Um, I think the first one is called Three Little 
words. Three little words, yeah. And then three more words, or is that correct? Am I getting yeah. it right? <laughs> nice, nice I, easy sequel. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm, you know, you mentioned a little bit why we love to find out the people their why. So what what makes you want to speak up to talk to people all over the world to write books about your experiences to share a little bit about your why? Well, part of my why came from necessity. So when I was a little kid, I lived in one foster home that had 16 kids sharing two bedrooms and a trailer. And we were wow. beaten, starved, locked outside. I mean, it was absolutely horrific. And you know, I, I'm a redhead, so I don't know if it's just that I'm naturally a little bit feisty or what, but I would go to school as a little kid. And I would say, I think I was about seven or eight years old in this home. And I would tell my teachers and counselors and pretty much anybody that would listen to me, I would tell them what was going on in this home. And fortunately, educators, social workers, medical professionals, um, doctor, you know, all of these people are mandated reporters, which means they are legally required to report suspected child abuse. So fortunately, there were some investigations sparked, but unfortunately, so many of the other kids in that home were so terrified to admit what was really happening. So I was thrown out of that home, but the state had allowed them to adopt eight of the kids that were in that home. And I was so angry and frustrated because I couldn't understand how people could lie and cheat and hurt children but kids like me were just, you know, thrown out with the trash. Mm -hmm. So my why really came out of this burning passion to try to protect some of the other kids that were left in that home, um, yeah. including my own biological brother who was almost drowned by them. So oh gosh. there was just so much horrific stuff happening. And so here, what, what am I going to do as a seven, eight year old, right? <laughs> you know, I'm just, all I could do was tell. And so I would tell and tell, but when I would when I would talk about it, I would be branded a liar. And so I think that just really festered this stubbornness and this determination <laughs> to do something. But the craziest thing, I know we only have a little bit of time together and I got a whole big life to pack into a small amount of time. So <laughs> fast forward a little bit. And when I was 16, I had been adopted from a children's home by that point. And I was sitting with my adoptive parents watching the news and up on the screen popped two mugshots on the local nightly news. And they were the mugshots of those former foster parents. Oh, goodness. Wow. They had been arrested on over 42 counts of felony child abuse with wow. torture. So finally, there was evidence that somebody was listening to the kids mm -hmm. and somebody was finally taking action. And so that happened when I was a teenager. And so I went to my adoptive parents and I was like, you guys, we've got to say something. We've got to do something. We've got to back these kids up. I mean, I, as you said earlier, school was a huge sanctuary for me. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very lucky that I was not born drug affected and I didn't have a learning disability or a cognitive impairment. So I really thrived in school. I, I loved it. Um, and so, you know, I pestered and pestered. I was a straight A student. And, and if they called me a liar, what were they going to say about some of these other kids whose trauma was manifesting in really unproductive right, ways? Right. And so I was like, I've got to back up what they're saying because it's true. It's true. And unfortunately for my adoptive parents, around that time, I had seen the movie Aaron Brockovich. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and I was like, I was like, hey, like, <laughs> what, what's that about? You know, for when I speak to audiences now, there's a large portion of them who are too young to know the Aaron <laughs> Brockovich reference. <laughs> my heart a little bit but all, <laughs> you young people just hop on the old googly room yeah. and figure it out but that right. was like hey well you know this this could be so much bigger so ultimately um, my story was involved in a series of class action lawsuits in florida where the abuse happened and that was you know we're talking about that why well wow here is the why and that was the mm. first time that i was like holy cow, maybe my experiences and what I went through, here was a chance for me to come forward and share in a way that could change laws and policy, create transparency in the child welfare system, but also get tangible support for some of the youth who had 
far more horrific stories than I, because after I was removed, the abuse actually got worse and they were beating the children with boards that had nails mm. in it, threatening them with guns. I mean, it was just an absolute horror show. And so again, my why sort of came out of this burning desire to do something and help save even my own brother. And there was always in the back of my mind, this desire to go to college. That was a really big dream and goal of mine. And I had been adopted so late that I didn't have a college fund set aside across the country. It's really amazing because there are programs that are springing up that provide free college tuition or room and board or benefits for the veteran care, which is incredible, but that wasn't necessarily the case for me. Mm -hmm. when I was in care. So I started doing scholarships and writing contests and I would write about my story. And those were opportunities for me to try to get scholarships. But when I was, I think 16 or 17, I did an essay contest for the New York Times Magazine that asked participants to write about a day that was really life-changing. And I wrote about my adoption day. I wrote a tiny little mm. essay called Three Little Words. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I happened to win first place. And I talked about wow. how my, my adoption day wasn't this rainbows and sunshine occasion. It was terrifying because I had seen kids be unadopted and sent back. Like that's mm. the thing. You can unadopt a child wow. like an outfit that doesn't fit. Hmm. You can just return them. So yeah. I didn't believe in happily ever after. I didn't think that this was something that I even deserved. And so I wrote this really kind of raw story, but from that um, I, I won, which was amazing. And after it was published in the New York Times Magazine, publishers contacted me interested in hearing my full story. So here I was, you know, a, just a stubborn little teenager, yeah. <laughs> incredible opportunity. I had no idea what I was doing, but sometimes when something really incredible like that comes across your, your doorstep, you're not like, oh, no, thanks. I'm driving. Yeah. No! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. When it's awesome, you say yes and you figure out the rest later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, um, I love the so story. This, this is amazing. <laughs> and, and, and I want to focus on, you know, I, I love stories, how, we can come out of these ashes of difficulty and, you know, and, and be, become the best version of ourselves. And so can you talk a, a little bit about from that experience of, you know, going, getting this amazing award for, you know, writing this story to kind of where you are today? Absolutely. Well, that, I think that experience was totally um, just very inspiring and motivating, again, because when you're sharing really raw and personal parts of your life, it can be incredibly vulnerable. But having, you know, these little accomplishments, it, it helped me have kind of the courage. I'm admittedly very introverted in real life. You will always find me like in the back of the classroom, you know, I'm, maybe my face behind a book in public, you know, it's, I, it doesn't necessarily come naturally, but it comes from that place of just pure passion and necessity, because I know that there are so many more young people um, who, who need a voice, who are falling through the cracks, who have no one to speak for them. But also we live in, a, in an amazing country, but there are so many people here that don't know no, we have children domestically that are starving, that don't have safe homes, that yeah. have, you know, tremendous need. And when I was in grad school, I was really inspired by the idea of resiliency, exactly what we're talking about. How do you overcome? How do you take that next step? And it turns out that the key to resiliency is one person having one person in your corner, one person to look up to, to bounce ideas off of, to be that mentor, to be that role model. So it doesn't matter if someone is adopted or not. It's about community and connectedness and relationships. Relationships are the key to resiliency. And my, my story shows that DNA does not make family. Family are people that you surround yourself with who are going to have a positive impact on your life. And so taking a, a very that. real a very real message like mine hopefully will help people not only be inspired to overcome their hardships and put a little to be to be a bit cliche you know put put power to that pain and and have a chance to do something better for themselves and for others at the same time it's one of the most healing 
things that I've experienced in my life. So um, I went to college, I, I got a scholarship, which was amazing. And um, when I graduated my undergrad, three little words that the book was expanded. <laughs> uh, the book came out and became a New York Times bestseller, which like completely blew my mind. Um, and But then I went kind of living my life. I, I'm a speaker, so I'll go out and, and do talks. But, you know, a lot of this stuff has just kind of happened organically. Um, and I ultimately did have a second book because I'm a huge fan. And I think it's imperative that people practice what they preach. So yep. I became a CASA volunteer, which is a court appointed special advocate. So I was an advocate for children in the foster care system. But after I got married, my husband and I also became foster parents. And we cared for more than 25 kiddos in our home. And people looked at my story and they were like, oh, that happened so many years ago. Oh, things were so different. And I was like, hmm, excuse me, <laughs> because I had all these kiddos in our house and their stories, this was much more recently. I mean, their stories showed us that the same mistakes were happening. There was still so much work to be done. And because kiddos are growing up, we always need quality foster parents and volunteers and advocates. And so it was really their stories that were the inspiration for my second book. But because my books were published under the Young Adult Division of Simon & Schuster, they're meant for young readers as well. And so I had these young readers that were kind of growing up with my story. And I wanted to be mindful to them as well, because this is an ever evolving story. Yeah. I, I, I lean into positivity and humor and, you know, some of those elements as my coping mechanisms. But the reality is that people who are survivors of trauma or really intense circumstances, that stays with you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And in an effort to be truly authentic with who I am and the ups and the downs and all the things, I, I wanted to have some of my struggles in my adult life be present in my second book. Because even though the hits can keep coming, it's it's all about looking at the looking for what's next, what's going to happen next, owning those darker times. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's really hard for someone to be what they can't see, right? And so mm -hmm. yeah. you have to you have to know love and compassion and calmness and and righteousness and justness for you to know that those elements are on the other side. And so all of the work that I do today as a social worker, I'm I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Florida. And so I run um, a small mental health agency for children and families in high risk and high conflict situations. And I want to be able to instill in those kiddos the ability to transcend their circumstances, no matter what they are, because systemically, we don't have a lot of control. You can't control the family you're born into. You can't always control your circumstances, but teaching kids how to build those those platforms for resiliency and teaching them how to be productive members of society. Um, that's, that's sort of the core of the work that I'm doing today. That's awesome. I, I love the energy that you have. For those of you watching, you see that. I, I think you're just <laughs> glowing and we're talking about tough things, but, but I can sense that you, you've learned from those things and you're turning it around and helping others. I loved your description of family, that sometimes it could be DNA, but it's also the people around us who are supporting us. You'd also mentioned that you just need one person in your life. So I'm curious who that one person was for you or is for you. Well, when I was younger, I was very lucky to eventually be assigned that CASA, the court appointed special advocate in my book. It's called guardian ad litem because in Florida, mm -hmm. the program is called something a little different but I had a CASA volunteer. Now, CASA is a really interesting program. So again, for your viewers and listeners, if you Google CASA or Court Appointed Special Advocate in your city or state, you will likely find a program because this is a national program. And these are people from the community. They're not trained in any particular field. You don't need a PhD. You, mind you, you go through training, of course. Right. <laughs> but, you know, these are just people who want to be a voice and want to be an advocate. And they come from all walks of life and they get to go in and learn about a foster child but most importantly they get to go to court and they get to tell the judge what's really happening and because this is a volunteer-led program there's no one signing a paycheck 
There's, mm -hmm. there's not the same level of maybe bureaucracy or red tape. These are really authentic relationships that are formed. And so I, I had a guardian ad litem, CASA volunteer, who came in and she was, you know, this sassy woman who was like, okay, <laughs> I'm seeing an injustice in, in, in my neighborhood and this is unacceptable. I'm going to be a voice and be an advocate for this kiddo. And she was one of the only people who believed me when I said I was being abused. She helped get me out of those abusive foster homes and she helped get those foster homes closed so that they couldn't hurt more children. So that is the power of what a single person can do. And that was really um, a huge motivating force for me. And we're still in touch to this day, which is really beautiful. That's and awesome. um, I ultimately had more amazing role models. My adoptive mom is incredible. The attorney, um, her name was Karen Gievers, who did the lawsuits. She was, you know, it was, it was just now I have all of these amazing role models in yeah. my life. But it all started with this woman who said, hey, kids shouldn't be hurt. Kids should have school supplies. Um, it was because of her that I got my teeth cleaned and my hair cut. And I didn't, for some reason, like my regular caregivers weren't taking care of these little things, but she really mm. made sure that things were happening in my case legally and functionally. And that is the power that the average citizen has to make a difference in a system that seems so overwhelming. Of course, when you say, hey, we're going to have someone come on and talk about child mm. abuse. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but Every, every citizen has a chance to make a tremendous difference. Maybe you're a business owner who can provide job training for teenagers who are aging mm. out. Maybe you have a ton of money left over and you want to financially support nonprofits in your group. Maybe you're, um, you're a parent and you can organize a backpack or back to school drive for kiddos less fortunate in your community. Or maybe you just like hanging out with the animals. So yeah. go to the animals, you know, anything that you can do to just give of your time, talent, treasure, all of the things make such a difference. And when I say that these efforts are life or death, I don't say that casually because mm -hmm. I look at the outcomes of my former foster brothers and sisters and even my own biological brother. And we had such different outcomes from the age of 17 onward. He had at least one felony arrest nearly every year. And about three mm -hmm. years ago, he died from a heroin overdose. Oh, no. So, you know, this is, it's a very personal and, and painful, but important reminder of how these small acts of kindness can create these ripple effects in the life of a young person that you will never know. I mean, no one could have told little stubborn Ashley in foster care that I would be doing the things that I'm doing today. Not a chance. I don't yeah. think anyone that, although I did have one foster parent. So for my books, I went back and I interviewed a lot of people and players. And one of my foster parents said that they were pretty sure that I was either going to become one day president or a bomb maker. So <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> wow, that's quite the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. It really is. So what you know, somewhere in that in that realm. But um, you know, I just I really hope that my story serves as an example of the good that can come when people um just just care. Yeah. yeah I love it. I, I do. And you you brought up humor and I you know, I want to touch on that a little bit. Every once in a while I'll ask a guest to to share share something that happened to them in their life that is funny so basically what can we laugh uh, <laughs> laugh at you about actually <laughs> child abuse isn't funny yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how is that not innately hilarious yeah um funny for me i mean I, I think the funniest thing right now is that you know there's an entire chapter in my first book called testing testing where here i am adopted people think adoption uh -huh. is oh i should be so grateful happily ever after but no it was it's trauma you know you're working through it and but i right. was pushing every button my adoptive parents had i mean needless to say i was not always the polished young woman you see <laughs> <laughs> i was horrific okay i'm gonna give it to you straight but 
the funniest thing now is that I'm a mother. Uh, we have three children who are now seven, eight, and nine. Our eldest is also adopted from the foster care system. And basically, that's life's joke. And my parents laugh at me every single day because they are dishing back everything I gave to my <laughs> adoptive parents. Yeah. I am getting it back 20 fold. And so, my, you know, the more I suffer, the funnier it is for my parents. <laughs> you know, this is the ultimate pop pop and Gigi revenge channel. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Ashley, I love your energy. I just, I think you've given some fantastic advice. Just things that you've said are amazing. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's kind of funny that you say you're an introvert, but yet we're, we're having this fantastic discussion and I don't see that. Um, I think you're because I'm alone with just an iPad. So yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I'm happy that you're willing to open your voice, um, open your heart and your, your life for everybody. Um, and hopefully you can keep, um, speaking to the world and, and sharing your message so that you can be an advocate for those that sometimes don't have that voice. So I commend you for that. Thank so Ashley, you. Jason and I have come up with what we call the double down dose. You ready for this? Bring it on. So I have a question, then he'll ask you a question. And we love talking about hope. Our podcast is called, called Sprinkle with Hope. So the, que the first question is pretty simple. How would you define hope? I think hope is the recognition that there is something better on the horizon. Mm, love it. Love it. And so the, so, uh, the follow-up question to that would be, and I, and we haven't asked this for a little while either, uh, but we created an acronym H O P E heart overcome passion and enough. And so I want to, I want to get your definition of what you think it means to be enough or have that self-worth in you to know that you are worthy of these things of love, kindness, all of these things, what, what would you define you being enough or those out there that, you know, may be lacking in, in that self-confidence or self-worth? Well, you know, the concept of being enough kind of implies that there's an end game, like, oh, I feel enough, that's it. But what I really want to reinforce is that all of this it's a process and you're gonna have those highs, you're gonna have those lows, you're gonna have those moments of self-doubt, but you have to own your feelings and circumstances as they're unfolding before you and your heart and your head don't always align. Mm. So your heart is going to be, you know, fleeting and you're going to have these emotions and you're, you'll have these highs, these lows. Sometimes your trauma or your experience or your current circumstances are going to be so crushing, but you have to have the knowledge to know that kind of common sense, that executive functioning to, to realize that this will pass. But the key for that to be effective is that you have to have been able to see what that is. If a child has never had that moment of pure joy or even an adult, if you don't know what that is, it's really hard to aspire to something yeah. you've never experienced. And so I hope that all of the grownups listening will do their part to start enriching future generations so that they can have those blueprints to tap back into when those darker moments occur but it's okay to have setbacks things things are not always great I mean even for me during COVID I was pulled off the road and so I I couldn't speak I couldn't do anything and that yeah. terrified our family because I'm the sole provider for our family mm -hmm. and so you know even even people who seem to have it all together we don't <laughs> <laughs> blurry background on these zoom meetings for a reason because yeah. we, we do not always have it all together and that's okay that's yeah. totally okay but your personal experiences and particularly your adversity those are going to be the elements those hardships are going to be the thing that actually make you that much more capable of succeeding once you once you've gone through it but it's not you know it's not an end point the success isn't like oh, i'm successful oh the end it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ashley i have really enjoyed this discussion i'm super grateful that you took some time out of your busy day to 
to meet with us. I, I really have been looking forward to this day for quite a while. So I'm super thankful for you that you're willing to open your yourself up to us and our listeners. So for those listeners who want to get in contact with you, how, how would you like them to contact you? Well, I'm actually like 95 on the inside. I called it Snapagram the other day. <laughs> so <laughs> I am available on social media, though it is sort of painful to watch me utilize those platforms. Yeah. But I'm a real life person. My website is roads-quarter.com. Um, I'm also available on social media. And I don't know, I, I'm, I'm real and these are real stories and I'm always happy to connect with people who have shared experiences or if I can ever be useful or point someone in a direction of advocacy or change making, I'm happy to do so. Thank yeah. you both so much for this chance to share. Yeah, it's been an amazing conversation and, and just, you know, any, is there any parting words that you'd like to, to share as we close this, this episode out? Is there anything else that you'd like to, to give to our listeners or, or provide to them that, that might be helpful at this time? I think it's, again, these are really challenging times and sometimes people can hear a really inspiring story, but it does the opposite. It actually like, oh man, well, what am I doing with my life? The, the big key to resiliency that was aside from the one person, what was really compelling to me was that resiliency and change and that true makeover of your life, no one is born predisposed to be more resilient than another. It can come at any age, any stage, and at any period in your life. So whether you're just beginning this advocacy or self-transformation or wherever you are in the timeline of your life, it is never, ever, ever too late to start making these small changes, implementing that self-care, having those moments of self-awareness that will allow you to be the best version of yourself and actualize the kind of life that you want to have because success looks totally different for everybody. Even, yeah. even concepts such as wealth, what, what is wealth? You know, it's kind of arbitrary. What is, what is like immensely, oh, that's so much accomplished. Like identify and define those things for yourself. And I think that's going to be how you set yourself up for feeling really good about what you're doing in your life is having those realistic goals and expectations and what feels like enough for you. It's a very individualized process. I even think about other like survivors. Some become advocates like me, but others, they don't want to think about these, these yeah. times in their lives. And I'm very fortunate that I now have a robust support system. And fortunately, most of my friends are therapists. So I, <laughs> you know, I'm surrounded by people that can help me process when I'm really struggling yeah. with my own life and issues or when trauma pops up unexpectedly. And so no matter what you choose to do with your life or your circumstances, these are all very personal choices and there's no right way to overcome. There's no right way to serve the community. And even if serving the community is just being not even just if, if you decide that being the best parent you can be, that's amazing. Yeah. Like you don't have to have audiences of 20,000 yeah. people to make an impact. I found the most change and the most incredible things have happened on the grassroots level. And even when we're talking about identifying ways to help children overcome, it's those one-to-one -one relationships that are going to be ultimately the most meaningful. So I don't know, get at it audience. Like you can do this. It's going to be okay. Those dark days are not the thing that are going to define you. Love, Love it. it. Thank you again so much, Ashley, for your time. Super grateful for you. Oh, happily. Thank you both so much.